Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us to the Mayfair Investment Club E-Series Talk, the seventh edition. It's Friday, the 12th of June, 2020, 1 p.m. London time. My name is Tatiana Doronina, and I will be moderated, moderating today's webinar. Our keynote speaker today is Alessandro Caccini, the board director of the Mo Technology and Serial Investor. And my co-host today is Samir Sarik, founder and executive chairman of the Mayfair Investment Club. Alessandro will give the presentation and discuss the fintech uh, and artificial intelligence in the financial markets, a revolution or evolution underway. The session will last one hour and the first part, it will be around 30 minutes. It will be dedicated for Alessandro to make a presentation. I would encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation and um, uh, Alessandro will try to answer one or two questions per block. And then the next session, or the next part will be uh, 25 minutes for Q&A, when you are welcome uh, to ask any questions you like. And I would like to encourage you to do so because we want to, the session to be more interactive. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and published on the Mayfair Investment Club YouTube channel later. So now I pass uh, the word to Alessandro and I'm gonna put the presentation up. Give me a second, please. Sorry, a bit. Hmm. Sorry, it's a technical, little technical issue. Oh God. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I just literally. Okay, okay, here we go. Very good. So thank you, Tatiana. Uh, thank you, Samir. Thank you, everybody, for inviting me to talk about this uh, fascinating topic. Uh, so about fintech and artificial intelligence in the financial system. Uh, maybe you can go to the first uh, slide. Uh, we, uh, I decide to divide in three blocks the today presentation. One block is a little bit more general about artificial intelligence and fintech. The second block is about the fintech growth, so the numbers of fintech uh, uh, today in the world that, uh, trust me, are quite impressive. And uh, the third block is about uh, two case studies to better understand how fintech and artificial intelligence really can impact the financial markets and the life of everybody. Next. Next. <laughs> okay, so why fintech are changing the rules of the financial system? Uh, you see uh, the circles on the right that define the, I mean, the main elements of the financial system today. So we talk about, for example, payments. Uh, if we talk about payments, uh, you can imagine uh, how uh, the fintech change uh, the, the paper, sorry, the plastic uh, payments. Uh, you have a debit and credit card. So you experiment in the last uh, years, a uh, huge change. So today, for example, you have the contactless um, technology that uh, doesn't exist a few years ago. Uh, if you go to the payments, uh, uh, you can withdraw money with QR uh, through the smartphone. That's unbelievable if you think about it. So with a QR, you are able from an ATM to withdraw your money. Uh, then uh, talking uh, not uh, about the customer, but about the system itself, you have challenger banks today, thanks to FinTech. Uh, what is, who is a challenger bank? Challenger bank, for example, is a digital bank competing with the major banks, uh, uh, mostly on the digital world. So offering digital services, that uh, the traditional banks uh, don't do. Uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, I mean, uh, we know perfectly Bitcoin, but today it's possible to pay through apps, uh, uh, to pay in Bitcoin uh, sometime, uh, taxes, bills, uh, coffees. So uh, it's a reality, it's not uh, simply a, a virtual uh, currency. Uh, then you have all the sector of the data aggregation. Uh, data aggregation is the capacity for the company to um, scrap data, financial data, and create analysis and scoring with this data. 
to give you an example, a big company called Plaid in the US was recently acquired from Visa for more than $5 billion. And uh, Plaid do exactly that business. So basically uh, aggregate data, then money transfer. Of course, now today you can uh, transfer more money in all the world through apps uh, in seconds. Uh, without to move from your house, without to pass investigation from the bank officer asking you why, et cetera, et cetera. And that's, of course, all that uh, is uh, a big, uh, uh, big changement. Uh, we call it in the, in the title of uh, <clears throat> the today discussion, we, we talk about revolution and evolution. So, uh, the, probably the key word of the fintech space is disruptive. No? Uh, everything in, uh, in artificial intelligence and fintech is disruptive. And disruption, if it's not the same thing of revolution, I mean, it's something very, very close like, uh, like concept. Uh, an interesting sentence is uh, the one that we write here. So the financial system is adapting products and services to artificial intelligence creating for FinTech a huge space that probably will replace at all the actual infrastructure. It's not easy, of course, to replace uh, infrastructure that exists from uh, centuries, but the, the speedness of the artificial intelligence, uh, the application of the FinTech technologies, and I will add uh, with some other important tool, like for example, the blockchain, are literally uh, revolutioning this world very, very fastly. And next slide, please. And uh, the consequences is that also the financial institution are taking advantage about that. So it's not only a attack, let's say, of the artificial intelligence and the FinTech guys to the old traditional economy. That's something uh, with a lot of mutual uh, uh, benefits. Mm, particularly for the financial institution, uh, the benefits are in terms of uh, risk assessments, fraud detection and management, financial advisory services, trading and managing finance. Uh, the first thing that, uh, that we can say is that uh, the challenge, the big challenge that the financial institution, the traditional financial institution are uh, actually fronting is the reduction, constant reduction of margin. Uh, is uh, is very difficult today for a traditional institution to make money like before, because they cannot uh, uh, top up this uh, cost uh, to the client for evident reason but they have a quite a strong uh, structure to maintain. So uh, to recuperate margin, artificial intelligence and uh, the FinTech technology uh, is probably the main uh, solution for uh, that bank. They, uh, they save a foolish amount of money uh, in the fraud detection. They uh, save a lot of money in the risk assessment because they do actually through algorithm. No? Through, through robots, let's say. And that uh, is very, very convenient for them. Uh, and in terms of efficiency of the service and in terms of cost uh, saving. To give you an example, uh, Fidelity, uh, at the huge financial company, invests $2.5 billion per year in the new technologies uh, to help the service to improve and to reduce cost. And uh, in the last uh, two years, they are uh, using just artificial intelligence and uh, fintech uh, to make what they call it the bond uh, default prediction. So there is not tens of people of analysts uh, examining uh, the, the probability that the bond will not reimburse it, but is all based on algorithm and uh, prediction. That's of course very, very important and permit also to the financial institution that are the, the parents, let's say, of the fintech company of today to take a lot of advantage about the, the present and the future technology. Please, the next. 
that's a little bit deeper what I said before. So the combination of fintech and artificial intelligence drive disruption in the financial system. And uh, we start from a very, very easy thing. I mean, uh, all of us experimented a chat with a bot. So when uh, we go to customer support, to customer service, uh, today is practically impossible to talk with somebody, no? You have uh, great answers sometimes, sometimes not that, uh, that good, but they are bots that interact with you. Uh, and that technology permits uh, to increase the number of queries, the number of uh, answers dramatically. Today, uh, the bot technology support more than 200 million uh, interaction daily. So imagine 200 million people trying to, to answer to the question uh, uh, worldwide. It would be practically impossible. Then you have, uh, uh, again, all the, um, the topic of the data acquisition. The data acquisition with the, with the FinTech change completely. Uh, why change? We change it because uh, we focus with the FinTech technology is possible to focus directly to the customer. So the data that uh, the FinTech market take then is uh, refined to come back to the customer, giving a specific product that, uh, of course, the algorithm and the artificial intelligence thinks that uh, will be the best for him. Of course, we can imagine that uh, uh, sometime can be a little bit uh, noisy in the sense that uh, you see a lot of marketing come to you. No? I imagine everybody will experiment uh, a lot of pop-ups uh, during the, the navigation of internet asking you to subscribe things that, uh, that you need. But I think also that honestly, we can say that the 80% the of that marketing uh, eat some interest that we really have. It's not a random marketing, uh, uh, asking us to subscribe uh, uh, course in Chinese uh, when I already speak Mandarin or uh, mm, trips uh, by plane uh, when I hit the, the, the plane. So it's something that is really efficient and again, cost saving and probably giving uh, to the client, to the customer, uh, the possibility to, uh, to live uh, a good experience. No? because go to it something that really the client or the customer needs. Uh, about the algorithm, uh, algorithm uh, trading, that's uh, massive. Uh, the last line can give you the, the idea about the importance of the, of the algorithm part in trading. Uh, we, <clears throat> we calculate today that uh, uh, computers generate between the 50 and the 70% of the equity market trade worldwide. So that's enough to explain the importance about that. Then uh, two parts that are the credit risk valuation and the fraud detection. Uh, that part is very important uh, in, artific in artificial intelligence because are, I will say, uh, two of the area where uh, artificial intelligence give the best. Artificial intelligence is so good in uh, uh, detect uh, uh, anomaly, wrong things, and uh, uh, to elaborate it, to detect it, and to manage it. Of course, a credit in the credit risk and in the fraud detection uh, is very, very important to understand uh, what is wrong or what eventually can be wrong uh, uh, on, the, on the client side or on the transaction side. Uh, in the case of the credit risk, uh, the, as we said before, the way artificial intelligence analyzes the data is completely different with respect to the past. Uh, in the past, a classic credit bureau, um, when detect that maybe you had a problem with a check, uh, uh, unpaid check 20 years ago, that was enough uh, to block you for every kind of new opening of accounts, for example. Uh, the, the, the use of the data from the fintech technology and the artificial intelligence technology is completely different. The entry point to understand if you are uh, a good customer or not is not uh, about the past, really. 
is about uh, the, the model that for us uh, we apply to the customer and uh, about the prediction of the goodness of the customer. So it's more important to understand if the customer will have the possibility to reimburse a credit uh, than to know if the customer was a very good uh, uh, in reimburse uh, credit uh, six months ago because of course the credit is uh, a future is not something related to the past both thing the credit risk evaluation and the fraud detection uh, enjoy of the same uh, efficiency in terms of uh, be completely digital so 100 percent digital and to be very cost efficient 100% uh, digital uh, means that uh, is, of course, real time. So you have the product, you have the service immediately. Usually when people uh, need money, they need money now. They don't need money in, in, the, in the future. Uh, to be 100% digital means that you really don't need to move. You don't need to get out from home. Uh, and the third thing, the, the, <clears throat> to be cost efficient, means that you can serve more people than before because uh, you can uh, reduce the cost of the service and you can uh, uh, implement you can really increase the frequency of uh, the checkings because with uh, a, a small cost in terms of, uh, of service for example if we talk about credit risk you can repeat a credit risk uh, if you want every week maybe every day or maybe every minute if you need it. And that, of course, improve the predictive analysis and forecasting. So uh, again, the beauty of artificial intelligence, uh, as uh, you can read, is able to pick hidden patterns that humans can't recognize, such as repetition in the attributes of the payment that consists of just random sequences of number and letters. So something that is uh, very good for, sci for scientists, not for common people. Uh, I remember a beautiful, a beautiful, um, a great movie that was Beautiful Mind with, uh, with Russell Crowe, where the, <clears throat> the Russell Crowe was able, the professor in this case, uh, was able to really to detect uh, hidden patterns uh, in very complicated flow uh, of formula. But uh, at the end of the story, this guy uh, get crazy. So. Uh, uh, humans are not really prepared for that, not to analyze that kind uh, of uh, flow of data and to detect uh, uh, small uh, things that uh, doesn't go in the right direction. Uh, computer, yes, are very good and do it. And uh, this market, the predictive analytics and forecasting is, uh, is increasing the market share uh, every month, every year consistently. So we can go to the next uh, slide. Tiana. Okay. Uh, by the way, I wanted to ask you, uh, because as I'm sharing the screen, I can't ch see the chat. So if you see any questions, Samir, if you see any questions, please uh, help me out and uh, say it sure. out. Okay, thank you. So to give some number, uh, we talk about today in the world, 100 million of unbanked, so sorry. Actually, the FinTech uh, was able to reach more than 100 million of unbanked people. Unfortunately, the unbanked people are really more than this. Uh, today in the world, uh, you can, uh, we have, uh, you can see more than 10,000 FinTechs globally around the world. But the impressive number is that uh, FinTech was able to reach more than 2 billion users all over the world today. And uh, the, the sentence that data is the new oil is because uh, all this, all this big market, all this big technology uh, have in the data the fuel of the machine. So to move all this technology, artificial intelligence and uh, at fintech you need data uh, and so uh, data uh, have a value that is increasing uh, every year constantly 
And that's the reason why for us, uh, we consider data as the new oil. So a great asset for getting the oil price in the last, uh, <laughs> in the last months. So maybe we can go to the next slide. Uh, Alessandra, could I just ask a question on, Please, on, 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 on the data? Because it's very interesting. Um, I think uh, we are really um, experiencing, some would say, a, a, a third world war that <laughs> includes a, a really the kind of digital currency and what, what China released uh, last month and what's really pushing during the COVID-19. Um, how, how do you think with the fintech and AI, uh, the sort of landscape of the of future, um, uh, call it economic uh, or economical world order will really pan out? And, and, and where do you see opportunities for the investors, both young and uh, seasoned, to actually come in right now rather than wait another six or 12 months to see how the pandemic is going to pan out? Yes. It's a very interesting question because uh, uh, data, as you, as you mentioned, uh, actually are everywhere. No? Uh, we talk about, uh, about data uh, when we talk, uh, uh, for, we will talk for sure uh, in the next months about the US uh, elections. We will talk a lot about data. We talk about data when we talk about economics. Uh, so, but for example, very easily, <clears throat> we discuss a lot about the data uh, processing uh, uh, when we talk about the patient in COVID period. No? Everybody saw the big differences in the way the data was processed and released to the, to the media. So data are a very, very sensible market. Now, if we talk about uh, uh, financial data, uh, I would say that uh, uh, the financial data uh, need to be somehow and uh, every time uh, more consistently implemented with blockchain technology, in my view. So the next future will be a implementation, a strong implementation between uh, uh, the data processing, acquiring and processing, but that processing will be, uh, will be done through blockchain technology to give uh, at least uh, the, I mean, uh, some kind of warranty that the data that we are receiving was processed without corruption of, uh, of data. And so all the, um, all the fintechs that will uh, work uh, on the blockchain technology side and particularly with attention to the data processing, uh, in my view, uh, will have uh, a big market. So, so uh, just before you move to the next thing, I mean, you've kind of uh, uh, said that data is the new oil. It's the currency, as we know, it's becoming a new cash because it, as a digital currency. So it, it's really going to be the, the, the fight and the battles over the data ownership, uh, obviously for the financial uh, companies and, and the fintechs that uh, who own data could also help that data improve their own uh, balance sheet and their own profitability and be able to get into the acquisition mode of, uh, you know, buying out their competition and, and kind of, uh, in a way, uh, although disrupting the traditional business models, but also getting into the monopolistic position, the more strength they're given and the more money they have. And we've seen with the big, big, tech players around the world, they're almost running you know, semi-monopolies in the sense of the, uh, the data ownership and data acquisition and then the ability to sell it on. I mean, how does one use disruption to continue uh, to democratize the market rather than create a new monopolistic forces that are really only replacing the old traditional uh, players in the marketplace? Again, you pose challenging questions. <laughs> and uh, I don't want that somebody will come to kill us nighttime. And so, but I'm, I'm joking, of course. Uh, I think that an important, uh, uh, important uh, thing that will happen. If that event future, happens to me, you know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we are touching big, uh, big, uh, big interest, of course. No? Not only about the billion of dollars uh, representing the data ownership, the big data, but also they, they use that uh, not financial 
entities uh, are doing with the same data. By the way, in my view, one important thing that will happen in the future, uh, apart the validation of the data, as I told before, uh, so the blockchain validation that will be important, uh, will be a, a, a little bit of separation between the ownership of the data and the ownership of the processing, the elaboration of the data. Uh, in the past, uh, uh, everything was in one pot and it was very dangerous because if you are the owner of the data and the owner of the result of the processing of the data, that's an uh, unbelievable power. So uh, quite dangerous, I would say. Uh, if we will be able uh, to split the ownership of the data, that will be, of course, of the people. No? So I will be the owner of my data, you will be the owner of your data. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the result of the elaboration of the data that can be ownership of somebody else, that will be a great, a great uh, uh, result. And uh, I think will protect the privacy of, uh, of every, everybody as possible, Samir, because the, the concept of privacy, of course, uh, changed a lot in the past and will change a lot in the future. Uh, and in, on that, I will point a lot on the digital identity. Uh, something very important will be the improvement of the digital identity all over the world uh, because the digital identity will permit to assign a clear ownership to somebody and then will be more difficult to take that kind of identity using for some, uh, some other scope. Mm. Thank you. Welcome. So uh, we are in the second part of the panel. We have other questions, uh, Tatiana, or we can uh, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, th that's why I, I cannot see because I'm sharing the screen. So if Samir- uh, Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. We go ahead, don't worry. That to, to start to give some number, okay, about the FinTech uh, space. So uh, in 2000, uh, 2010, so 2010, uh, you can see that uh, the FinTech investment market was quite small. So we talk about 9 billion US dollar and uh, a couple of hundred deals, okay? Now, have a look on the 2019, and you will see that from uh, 9 billion, we are now on 135 billion dollars, and the deals uh, are actually more than 2,000. So is a consistent increase uh, of uh, investment activity from the part of the VCs, the, the private equity and the merchant acquisition. If we see in the next slide also the geographic, we see that in the 2010, the practically uh, the, the USA was the driver of, the, of this market with uh, uh, 257 deals and 7.5 billion on nine. Europe was with only 62 deals and 1.5 billion. So really USA was uh, the only laboratory for FinTech in uh, 2000, uh, 2010. Uh, on the next slide, you will see that today, the things are quite different because today, uh, USA uh, increased the number of, uh, of course, the number of the deal and the number of, uh, the investments, but Europe, as you can see, in terms of uh, value, uh, almost reach United States. Uh, the deal are less in Europe because Europe like bigger ticket usually, like more structured uh, companies. So the investment, the single investments are higher like ticket. And the new kids on the block in this case are Asia, where you can see uh, 12 billion and 547 uh, um, deals and Latin America, that uh, is quite interesting, with uh, not a lot of investment, 4.4 billion and only 193 deals, but it's very recent. Uh, I will say that the more interesting market in terms of uh, development are actually really Asia and Latin America. We will see also Africa, of course, Africa in terms of uh, customer, not actually in terms of investment. On the next slide, thank you. Tatiana, we will see then uh, uh, that a lot, 
has been done, but a lot more can be done for the reason, the main reason that you can see here. Let's talk about uh, the technology. Uh, Mr. Musk, uh, the Tesla CEO, <laughs> used to say that we are uh, already a cyborg because the, the interaction we have with our smartphone and with our computer uh, is completely, I mean, is uh, un almost 100%. So we are already cyborg. So uh, it's very important to see the penetration of the technology and the tools in the, on the markets. You can see that the 59% of the population still does not own a smartphone. So they are potential customers that actually are not able to connect themselves to the fintech space. We talk about 4.5 billion people, okay? On the other side, you see that uh, almost 2 billion, almost 2 billion people worldwide actually are unbanked. So they don't have a bank account. Most part of the time, not because they don't want to have it, but because they don't qualify for a classic bank account. They are one of the famous, as we call it in the, in the market, invisible. No? The 50 of them, we talk about uh, almost 1 billion, already own a smartphone. So uh, we talk about a tomorrow potential customer base for fintech companies, about 1 billion people. That, that's the private side of the market. The corporate side of the market, the micro and medium uh, enterprises have a huge gap in, on the financial market globally. We calculate that more than 5 trillion US dollar are not able to match the financial need because the banks are not able to arrive or to calculate or to see that needs. Uh, and the 50% of formal micro and medium enterpriser have no access to the credit. I would add that uh, in Africa and Latin America particularly, uh, there is uh, at least another 10, 15% of enterprises that are not formal. They are the so-called informal, no, informal enterprises, but their business, uh, I mean, at all, they are, they make sales, uh, they have revenues, they are informal because they don't present balance sheet to say. So the market is really huge. The last thing that is important uh, and uh, that one of the reasons why the market will grow is because also the regulations came to a maturity today. For the regulators, it was very diff difficult uh, years ago uh, to, to understand that market because they had not instrument to to understand that market. Today is easier for them to understand the market. A new generation also of uh, people came uh, to, the, to the regulatory bodies and that helps a lot. And now the reg tech uh, is, uh, is going, uh, uh, is helping greatly, greatly the, um, all the regulation framework and of course the open banking as well. Uh, to give you an idea, uh, just a few years ago, the cryptocurrency exchanges was considered a bunch of bandits, practically. No? They was banned because, uh, because of the scams that effectively was sometimes, and the frauds. Uh, recently, Japan authorities uh, decide to, uh, to improve a model to regulate the cryptocurrency exchange, and this model is based on blockchain. So, they are using the right medicine to treat the patient. Fintech to regulate fintech. That's great. Please, the next slide. As I said before, the, the continents that will enjoy more in the next future uh, uh, of the improvement and the efficiency of the fintech are uh, Latin America, Asia, and Africa. Uh, and that's very important because we talk about Mm, a lot of poor countries. And one of the mission of the FinTech effectively, as Samir said before, talking about democratization, is uh, uh, the financial inclusion of the unbanked people and democratization of the market. That's very important because the invisible today are the majority of the, of the human beings. That's something that 
is not easy to understand, but the most part of the people that today live in the world are not able to participate to the financial market. That's, uh, of course, tremendous. In the, in the, on the right side, you see the difference between uh, um, continent by continent on the utilization of the, of the fintech technologies. I'll give you just a few examples because I don't want to, to run late on time. Uh, the difference, for example, between LATAM and Africa, you can see that, uh, uh, for example, the, the fintech main industries uh, in LATAM are 24% of payments. In Africa, is the 40% of payments. And that because of the geography, of course, and that because of the social system, of course. Uh, Asia uh, is more concentrated on more sophisticated product like the financial comparison and the retail investment. Uh, so that's to show you the flexibility of the fintech technology that is able to adapt the technology to the different geography, the different social infrastructure, and to go in helping to improve and to democratize the whole system. Alessandro, could I just, uh, we've had two questions uh, which are uh, very much related to the, what you're talking right now in the previous one. The first question uh, was how can investors enter into fintech? What instruments are currently available? Uh, one, of, one of the attendees asked. Okay. Yes, that's of course important because uh, it's, a, it's a very nice pie, but somebody want to eat it. That's, uh, <laughs> that's correct. And... Uh, uh, Well, uh, I would say that uh, uh, the, the first thing to, to know is that uh, the, the investors are looking, of course, a lot on fintech uh, in the recent past. And the main reason is because of the, the capacity to produce value. No? In the past, uh, the capacity to produce value was uh, on the public market. The classic example is Apple. If you invested uh, one million in Apple because you met uh, Steve Jobs that he was creating Apple uh, and you uh, was arriving to the IPO, your earning was 600 times. So one million, 600 million. But if you invest the same million the, the day of the IPO and uh, you wait for, for years, anyway, you was uh, having a great success a couple of hundred times. So the difference was not unbelievable. Today is not like that. The, the, the hundreds are not on the public market anymore. But you know that Facebook, uh, that was one of the best performer, perform on IPO 4X. So uh, it is great, but it's not 600 or, or 200, I mean. Uh, so the, the, uh, as, the, as the specialists say, the, the alpha, the value creation moved in the last years from the public to the private. The only way to realize 100 is uh, on the private. Uh, the, the way the investors have uh, to enjoy this part of the, of the investments, of course, uh, I would say you can, uh, you can talk about three main ways and instruments. The first is the equity, of course. So you can invest in, uh, uh, in companies that uh, uh, probably prove that they have uh, capacity in the market, but they have a lot of space for upside and you participate to the investment uh, of the equity. The second way is uh, to participate to the, to the debt market of that company because that company usually pay high yield and, uh, and so you can participate. Maybe you can also, if you have the opportunity, use uh, also convertible uh, loan notes. So you can both enjoy for high yield, but you can also try to participate to the equity and that for sophisticated investors, of course. Uh, for a, a smaller investor, I would suggest uh, uh, the equity crowdfunding uh, platform careful, not the crowdfunding platform. I, I'm not talking about uh, Kickstarter. I'm talking about professional equity crowdfunding uh, platform that are able to 
make a great due diligence on the companies to permit you to invest $10,000, let's say, or $50,000, and to be sure, in case of success of the company, to enjoy the right, uh, uh, the right upside. Uh, so I would say that, that this is more or less the, the way the, the investors uh, have uh, to participate to, to this market. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandro. There was one more question, uh, uh, which I thought it was relevant to your second part is, how is unmet demand calculated? And could we get a breakdown of uh, MCME uh, by continents when it comes down to the unmet demand? The unmet demand is calculated from uh, a lot of uh, uh, international and independent authorities. So we go from the World Bank, the International Monetary Funds. We have uh, a couple of uh, fintech uh, uh, authorities looking, uh, looking for that, and they collect the data uh, year by year. So it's quite precise. And the fact that it's quite precise uh, is also the demonstration is that there is not a conflict on the numbers. So uh, th there is not, uh, sometimes you have conflict on the numbers. If, again, if we talk about elections, or some other, uh, some other area, arena. In this case, they're usually not conflict. That's the problem is that, is, uh, that uh, the unmet uh, are uh, a, a huge number, uh, really a huge number. Uh, I would say that uh, is a long process. For the rest, uh, the, can, the, political, uh, the political side and the regulatory side can help a lot. Uh, for that kind of project of, that you was discussing before, you was saying before, because the only way to, to be efficient uh, is to be legal. No, it, I mean the, the 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 possibility to operate in the different market and to give uh, efficiency to the market pass through uh, friendly regulation that will permit you to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Oops. So uh, we complete this, uh, yes, this uh, slide, as I told you. And uh, then we have uh, <clears throat> the, the case studies. Case studies are quite interesting because we can see uh, uh, what we discussed before. So the capacity to grow, to, to make numbers. And uh, we have uh, two parts of the fintech uh, world. Nubank, that is the classic, the, the classic, the, the one of the bigger challenger bank, as we call, and Revolut, that is a really a classic uh, fintech uh, that uh, elaborate one of the first uh, successful cards that uh, a lot of us have uh, in our pocket. Talking about Nubank, uh, you can see that uh, uh, is uh, a Brazilian bank that then had the opportunity to develop. Uh, to Latin America and uh, Germany. And the impressive uh, uh, thing is that uh, 2013, the, the birth date, they already have 20 million of customers. That is a good number. And uh, they raise on the market $820 million. They already have revenues for 126 million US dollars. So, is a consistent company, is a, is a great reality. And the products that they, that they issue are the classic product that a bank uh, issue. So you see the credit card, the new conta, that is the digital account, and then the, the rewards that they give to the client for the, for, the, for the expenses. But the way they do it, as we show, uh, we will show after, is a little bit different in respect to the normal bank, the efficiency they have. On the other side, Revolut, uh, uh, in, uh, in a very short period, you can see they, the birth date is 2015, okay? 2015, they already have 74 million US dollar and uh, 10 million plus customers. So that are great results, are not only on the cloud, we will say, but they are on the market. 
the valuation of these two companies, as you can see, are today $10 billion and uh, almost $2 billion. So very successful uh, fintech. The last things on this slide, uh, we talk about uh, artificial intelligence and fintech usually like a, a, a work breaker. No? So we know that the technology is creating a different, <clears throat> different way to work. Some people is losing uh, the employment because the, the, the model are completely changing. Uh, I, I spent a second to, to see that anyway, new bank that is a fintech, a digital bank, have uh, more than 2000 employees. And Revolut have more than 1300 employees. So we talk about companies that are very solid company and they are giving a lot of work to people and they will continue to, to do it. It's not only one nerd in a bedroom with a computer. So that's the, that's the fintech space. Today the fintech space is really competing with the, the bigger uh, traditional companies in the world. The next slide, please. When we say, uh, we talk about a unicorn among the dinosaurs, is because sometimes traditional banks are a little bit a dinosaurs, no? Uh, the, way, the way Nubank uh, uh, change the banking system in Brazil uh, has been really a, a revolution in that sense. Uh, they offer a, a quick onboarding, they offer the facial biometric uh, for the frauds that are something that doesn't exist before. And uh, uh, they are able to offer that service completely on cloud and on app. Uh, to give you an idea about the bank, why the digital bank uh, are the future, but in the reality are also the present, uh, in the last 10 years, <clears throat> just in European community, uh, the banks close more than 74,000 branches. 2008, 2018, 74,000 branches. That's a trend, is a trend that is faster. So probably in the next five years, they will close other 20,000, 30,000. The digital banking is the solution. There is not other, other solution on our, uh, on our way. Please go to the next one. That is Revolut. Okay, sorry, new bank, the, the, the results. You can see here, I will not spend a lot uh, here because are only <coughs> statistic, but you can see the, the index of grow, how quick they grow, how quick they reach the results they have now today. And uh, you see also the, the new bank's revenue uh, versus net income, quite impressive. The next slide, please. So Revolut. Uh, Revolut, uh, first of all, and uh, that's really amazing, they are able to onboard, to, to give uh, virtually a card in 60 seconds. In 60 seconds. Then they are able, as you see, to detect uh, to the 96% of the fraudulent transactions, that's artificial intelligence. Uh, they give the full control and flexibility to the client that is not only marketing, is real. And again, they do everything digitally. So they do everything on your smartphone or on your computer. The next, please. You see the economics. The reason why you see uh, the, the beginning of the growth of Revolut a little bit lower than new is because uh, Revolut decided to make fundraising through crowdfunding, not through a round of investments, so took a little bit longer. But uh, you see, 2015, you see at the end of 2017, uh, literally the company flight and the, cost, the customers too. Next. So we have a conclusion here. And the conclusion is that the financial industry re is really changing thanks to evolution of FinTech 
and the revolution uh, with the artificial intelligence model. Uh, actually, we talk about a space, the fintech space, uh, composed from, for, for more than 10,000 companies that reach more than 2 billion customers worldwide and is really focused on the financial inclusion of the invisible and the democratization of the process. We saw that Latam, Asia and Africa are the country that will grow most. And uh, uh, just to, uh, to point, uh, the case study showed that the winning point are better processes, the enablement of financial inclusion and the possibility of big investments you saw the, how much money they raise to reach that kind of parameters. That's the, the end of the presentation. I hope that was not too boring because usually <laughs> when we talk about numbers, it's not that nice. It was very interesting in for me because I'm far from FinTech for now, but like it was very clear. Thank you very much. And I, I, unfortunately, I couldn't follow the questions because I was sharing the screen and I didn't know that I don't, I don't have the access. So sorry for this. But now we can actually move to the Q&A session, if you don't mind. And we can start just like just one moment because I just saw the questions for the first time. Um, we can start with a question from Dirk, uh, our previous speaker. So um, social cohabitation between AI jobs and traditional employment, only opportunities or are there many hidden risks? Yes. Thank you, Dirk. And uh, in part, I answered a little bit before, no? when I showed the numbers of employee <clears throat> of Nubank and, uh, and Revolut. But I will try to enlarge a little bit the focus because it's a very interesting question. Uh, artificial intelligence, particularly, I don't want to talk only about FinTech, will change a lot the, the work in the next years. One of the, one of the, one of the most uh, valued uh, concept is that we are too, too many on the, on the, on the world, no? So the world is, uh, have too many people. Now, looking on the, looking on the, on the graphics and the forecast, in the reality, uh, this planet will not, uh, uh, will not experiment uh, a big uh, birth boom uh, in the next uh, 50, 100 years. Probably we will assist to a collapse of the birth. Why? Because when you have wellness, and the, the, the world is experiment more and more, uh, I mean, some, uh, some wellness in the, in the countries, uh, classically the demographic uh, go down. Uh, you can see, for example, the parameter, the, the numbers in Russia, Russia 20 years ago, 30 years ago, Russia now, completely different in terms of demographic. And the, and, and the, the trend is the same in all the world. So uh, I would say that artificial intelligence at the end uh, will contribute to make the work that other people will not make. Why will not make? Because probably uh, that's, a, that's, a, <laughs> that's an opinion of the CEO of Alibaba, the reality is not mine. Uh, we will work probably four hours a day, three days a week in the next uh, hundred years time. In the rest of uh, the time, we will, we will interact, we will enjoy life. But, of course, remember, the life will, will, uh, will be longer than now. Probably uh, the, the, the average uh, age will be under 20, under 30, if you are a woman. And uh, so uh, the, the, needs, the need will be uh, not only you, will be your, your father, your grandfather, probably your grand-grandfather. So the real job will be to take care about the people more than uh, to go to the, to the industry to work because we, we will have big robots to do that, honestly. And uh, the, the people, the white collar will be nice robots or bots that work uh, for you. You will supervise that. Uh, so I would say that uh, I'm not that afraid for the future. The next future is a different thing, of course. We will experiment uh, lots of work and employment in the next uh, 10, 15 years. But looking at the future, I think that uh, 
the artificial intelligence is the only way to contribute to the natural loss of the demographic that we will experiment in um, not a lot of time from here from now so hit the risk uh, uh, yes of course when you have uh, that kind of uh, tremendous technology you have a risk you have a risk and uh, uh, i would say that uh, artificial intelligence is smarter is not intelligent they are two different things i would say that artificial intelligence is uh, help us to better define the same concept of intelligence. Uh, 20 years ago, we think we was thinking that, no, maybe a little bit more. 40 years ago, we, we, we say that Mr. Kasparov was a genius, no? was uh, one of the most intelligent people of the world. Then AlphaGo, uh, 93, I don't remember the, the, the year, uh, AlphaGo uh, beat uh, Kasparov and uh, and then uh, AlphaGo, AlphaZero beat uh, the, the champion, uh, the world champion of Go, that we suppose was the most difficult game uh, all over the world. And then another artificial intelligence beat the artificial intelligence that won uh, the Go champion. Uh, what, what I mean is that uh, uh, we are redefining the same concept of intelligence. You are intelligent because you are probably resilient. You are intelligent because you are able to link dots that are not that evident. You are intelligent because you are emotional. And uh, all these kind of things, artificial intelligence cannot do it. I think it will not do it for a long time. Uh, so at the end, uh, I will say that uh, the artificial intelligence have potential risk because uh, is supervised by humans and humans make mistakes but humans are also able to resolve the mistake they make but also in this case um you're right that like it's supervised by humans and can you imagine like with what kind of power those people who will supervise with machines will have and so what about the security actually that's my really big question Yes, is a, there is a nice, uh, I had not the time, unfortunately, but I will give you, I tell you this because it's an that's very, very nice. Uh, um, one of the neural network, no, artificial intelligence are, at the end of the story, a replica of our neural network. That's the, what artificial intelligence is. Uh, uh, teach the, the, the network to recognize, to detect a banana, okay? So the picture of a banana. And uh, the human, uh, the, the, the artificial intelligence effectively detected that was a banana, the picture. Then the scientists put a sticker close to the banana, like this. No? This is the banana. This was the sticker. And of course, the, the artificial intelligence have a large database no? of, uh, to, to detect. Uh, uh, the artificial intelligence decide, 97%, that uh, that picture represents a toaster. Okay. So from a banana with the sticker, a toaster. You can imagine uh, if a hacker <laughs> can, uh, can, can do something bad uh, on that case, uh, maybe you are on a self-drive car and uh, some funny guy put a stick uh, on the stop sign and the artificial intelligence thinks that is a ship. That's maybe... why I don't like to talk with bots. <laughs> I, I remember my first experience, it was a Burberry website. <laughs> I realized that the, that was a bot, you know, like that, that's, that's the reason, yes. you know, it doesn't need me, but they kind of, they're learning, they're improving all the time. Yes, right? you need to re but by the way, you need to remember that, uh, uh, as I told you in the presentation, artificial intelligence is so good to uh, um, detect fraud. Of course, it needs to be supervised. So you have reason. Part of the democratization of the project will be who owns the title. That's, the, that's one of the problems that uh, I hope the humanity will be able to sort it out. Alessandro, could I just come in on what Tatiana said? Because security is something that is interesting lots of people out there. And you, early on in your presentation, mentioned data, but you also mentioned the word corrupt data. Uh, and we deal in the world of corruption uh, in politics and in business all around the world. So. You know, considering data is 
as you call it, new oil and new currency, and has been for some time. You know, how do, does one ensure that it's not abused uh, in election campaigns around the world and uh, is not uh, used for the benefit of the political elites and regimes around the world? I mean, you understand Africa and we understand the other parts of the world where there's obviously a high level of corruption and everything else. So, uh, you know, wh where would you see that and how can we improve the security over those elements and, uh, and, and, and sort of ensure that it benefits society rather than the uh, elites that are uh, ruling certain, certain countries or certain parts of the world? Tatiana, are you keeping a, a, a time key? Because uh, I think we have to, I can't see the time. From yeah, where actually I, we, we are running, running out of time already. It's uh, two. Where uh, are we? Because I have to leave at two. So it's two, yeah, so it's 2.3. So it's like three minutes. Okay, so okay. I think I thought you were keeping a, a timekeeping for that. Uh, oh, okay. I, I really enjoyed the conversation. So actually we can kind of slowly uh, start, like um, go to the finish. Okay, okay. so uh, finally, Samir, the final sentence, I repeat again, blockchain. Actually, the, we have a technology, the technology works pretty well, is uh, impossible actually to corrupt it. The problem will be to convince the politics to, to accept blockchain like uh, uh, a data processing validator, but we have the technology. So it's only about to use it. Yeah, a lot of things to learn, to be honest. But yeah, but it was very interesting. Thank you very much. I think Samir probably uh, ran to his meeting. So <laughs> sorry, it was my fault. You know, I was really enjoying the conversation. That's why like, it, it kept a little bit longer. So first of all, thank you very much, Alessandro, for a nice visuals. Nice visuals and nice uh, conversation, nice explanation of the situation. Um, thank you very much for everyone who, who is with us right now. Uh, I was really pl pleased to kind of serve you. So, yeah, so if you have any questions, uh, like uh, I'm talking to participants, if you have any questions, you can uh, message me or you can send me the email and I'll pass it to Alessandro and maybe he'll be kind enough to answer it and we'll, I'll send it back. So, yeah, so thank you very much again and have thank a Thank you, Tatiana. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.